welcome to Grasping the Word 2024. The verse of Acts chapter 4 and verse 12 is our verse of the week for February the 18th. The verse reads, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Again, that is Acts chapter 4 and verse 12. I'm going to read from a booklet written by Craig Sully, who is a missionary to the West African nation of Senegal. He wrote a booklet entitled Matthew 28, 19. This chapter is called Salvation in No Other Name. Speaking of Acts chapter 4 and verse 12, Sully writes this. In this verse, we have an inseparable link between salvation and the name. If we were to trace a few verses back, we would discover the name being referred to is the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Previous to this verse, a lame man was healed in front of the temple because of faith in the name of Jesus. Peter did not only heal the man, but used the attention gained from the miracle to explain that not only was healing found in the name of Jesus, but salvation was also to be found in that name. Peter was quite unreserved in his declaration that salvation cannot be found in any other name but the name of Jesus. We must conclude that the name of Jesus Christ is the only name of salvation. The scripture becomes vital to our understanding when we recognize that baptism and salvation are so closely associated. Mark declared, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Mark chapter 16, verse 16. Peter in his epistle declares that baptism does save. Jesus, when speaking with Nicodemus in John 3, likened being born again to being born of water and of the Spirit. Add to this the testimony found in the book of Acts of various believers being baptized, and we can see its vital role in salvation. Jesus had commanded all of his disciples to go teach, and baptize, Matthew 28, 19. We are responsible to do all that we have been commanded, not just in part. Baptism is vital to making disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. The New Testament epistles do not appear to reckon with the fact of an unbaptized disciple. How can one become a disciple and then be baptized. It is when a man who hears the gospel believes and is baptized that he becomes a full disciple. Baptizing belongs to the means by which a disciple is made. W. F. Fleming characterized the baptism of the earliest church as a sacrament of the gospel. Shatler, who stressed the same thing when he described a normal apostolic sermon as a baptismal sermon. Its purpose, he said, was not merely the acceptance of an idea. It demanded a definite act. This is said from the aspect of baptism as a response to the gospel and acceptance of its gifts. There are grounds for going further and suggesting that the fitness of baptism to be a means of response to the offer of the gospel is grounded in its fitness to be an embodiment of the gospel. The view of scripture is that the church is commissioned to make disciples by baptizing men. Sully continues, we have already noted the fact and affirm it again that baptism and remission of sins are inseparately associated. Without the remission of sin, one cannot be a true child of God. Therefore, baptism plays a vital role 
in our salvation because of the cleansing it provides. The blood of Jesus was shed for the remission of sins, and it is through baptism that the blood accomplishes this purpose. Remission of sins is central and critical to a man's salvation. So it is therefore only reasonable to conclude that baptism and salvation are inseparably linked on one to the other. Baptism is essential in making disciples according to the commission, and it is essential in salvation even in our day. Believing and baptism are criterion to salvation. They are exclusive within and not subsequent to salvation. They are part of the process, not independent of the process. A man is not baptized because he is saved. He is baptized so he can become saved. Again, we reference Mark chapter 16, verse 16. Peter also associated baptism and the remission of sins in Acts chapter 2, verse 38. There appears to be no doubt as to the intention of Acts 2.38. The penitent believer baptized in the name of Jesus Christ may expect to receive at once the Holy Spirit, even as he is assured of the immediate forgiveness of sins. Ananias also associated baptism with the washing away of sins and the name of the Lord in his instructions to Paul in Acts 22, verse 16. Peter again referred to baptism and salvation in his first epistle and declared the like figure whereunto even baptism doth also now save us, not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 21. We do not, however, contend that baptism alone as a physical act brings salvation. It must be an extension and manifestation of the faith that is present within the heart of the one who hears the gospel. Baptism is a vital aspect of salvation that cannot be ignored. Our key scripture for this section, Acts chapter 4 and verse 12, allows us to know that salvation is found only in the name of Jesus. Repentance, without which one will perish, according to Luke 13, verses 3 and 5, was to be preached in the name of Jesus Christ, according to Luke 24, verse 47. Remission of sins was also to be preached in the name of Jesus, according to that same verse. Peter, Ananias, and others have shown the remission of sins and baptism is one. Therefore, we must conclude in full agreement with the scriptures, baptism is in the name of Jesus Christ. Jesus also promised us that the Holy Ghost, which without which no man shall see God, Romans 8 and 9, would be sent in the name of Jesus Christ, John 14, verse 26. Thus we see the three aspects of salvation, repentance, baptism, and receiving the Holy Ghost are all to be associated with the name of Jesus Christ alone. Therefore, Acts 4.12 reveals to us that the apostles were correct in their fulfillment of the Great Commission by baptizing strictly in the name of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm.